My guest today is Professor Charles Spence, a world-famous experimental psychologist with a specialization in neuroscience-inspired multisensory design. He has worked with many of the world's largest companies across the globe since establishing the Cross-Modal Research Laboratory at the Department of Experimental Psychology at Oxford University in 1997. Professor Spence has published over 1,000 academic articles and edited or authored 15 books. His work focuses on the design of enhanced multisensory food and drink experiences through collaborations with chefs, baristas, mixologists, chocolatiers, perfumiers, and the food and beverage and flavor and fragrance industries. Professor Spence has worked extensively in the world of multisensory ex experiential wine and coffee and has also worked extensively on the question of how technology will transform our dining and drinking experiences in the future. We started the discussion addressing how many senses do humans have, after which we jumped right into important questions related to sensory overload, sense congruency, dominance and harmony. The second part of the discussion moved toward technology, as I usually like to do, brainstorming about how can we use the senses to provide the best immersive experience in augmented virtual and mixed reality. Here is the show. Hello, Charles. It is nice to have you on the show. My pleasure to be here. Well, there. <laughs> Thank you. You have dedicated a large part of your career to investigating how our brains process the information from each of our different senses and how this understanding can inform the design of multisensory foods, products, interfaces, and environments now and in the future. How did you get to start in this field? A uh, long, long time ago now, uh, probably back in 1989 or something, uh, I had to do a project for my degree in psychology on, um, and had left it too late. And uh, the only person who had a slot left was somebody with a broken TV who had this strange illusion playing the sounds of movies through his hi-fi. Credits would finish rolling at the start of the movie and somebody started speaking on the screen. There was a sudden disconnect because the voices were coming from loudspeakers and the hi-fi and the voice was on the front. Um, and then after a few seconds, this kind of illusion disappeared. Um, and I started out doing that, breaking TVs and moving the sounds around to see how our brain processes hearing and vision. And as the years have gone by, I've sort of added more and more senses. After we've done everything we could think of in hearing and vision, I think in touch and then moving more recently into the chemical senses of smell and taste and flavor, always with um, an interest in how the brain combines the senses on the one hand, but also kind of an applied interest in thinking how we can use these insights from brain science, psychological science around multi-sensory perception to enhance everyday life, experiences, environments, products, places, and interfaces. So starting with real world experiences. Uh -huh. So emotions and the senses are central to human experience, as you said, but first, how many human senses are there should we consider the canonical five sense categories as given to us by popular psychology? Or what other sensory modalities are involved in our lived human experience? How about the so-called forgotten senses like intuition? How do we start? Oh, well, I think a good starting point is with the canonical five. I'm not sure I necessarily want to blame the psychologists for giving us that number. I think it goes way, way farther back to probably the ancient Greeks, if not before, sure. Uh, sure. And across cultures. But certainly psychologists have um, adopted those as a good starting point, opening for discussion as to how many there are exactly, who knows? Definitely more than five, but it's all a matter of definition. At least when I, last time I asked people in my lab, my students, you know, how many senses do we think we have? I got numbers somewhere between seven and 13. So there's no agreement. But the ones I would add to touch, taste, smell, sight, and sound, canonical five, first off would probably be proprioception, where we feel our body parts to be, maybe kinesthesis, our feeling of our body in motion, and the vestibular sense, our orientation in space, 
And uh, thereafter, I'd be tempted to think about uh, the pheromonal sense. We have a regular smell. We smell fruits and trees, but also you know, animals have this kind of extra organ in their nose, Jacobson's organ, detecting social chemical signals from others of the same species. And there's some hint that we might have some pheromonal sensory ability, kind of direct olfactory communication with others without having to open our mouths. That might be number nine, is that so far? Uh, and then on to some who think we have a magnetic sense. And then when we go to the inside and say, not just how we perceive the world out there, but how do we perceive our own bodies? That gets you to you know, a sense of a lack of oxygen, maybe a sense of hunger. And the list goes on and on up to, I've seen in uh, some articles, maybe 43 senses by some respectable journals. Though amongst those, I think I would be tempted not to include a sense of time, nor probably a sense of intuition, or even that sometimes I guess called the sixth sense, sort of a feeling of knowing or sometimes, yeah. So a lot, which is good for me because then I have more multi-sensory interactions to uh, consider once I've run out of all the ways that the five canonical senses interact. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Of me. <laughs> but why, why would you not consider those kind of outlier senses like intuition? Is it because science has tried to disregard them? That may well be true, but perhaps separate from the question of whether they are senses. I guess to me, I'd probably go with more of a physiological definition. I'd like to see a sensory receptor, an organ, like we have eyes and ears and nose and tongue and skin. Um, and if we don't have for the pheromonal sense, we have, you know, it may be defunct in us, um, vestigial, but we do have the pits, some of us, in our nose that other animals use for this sense. So there's kind of the structure there. Um, and I guess I, I'd want some sort of perceptible input, some sort of stimulation, whereas you know, oftentimes what's talked about is a sixth sense or intuition or a feeling of time, sense of time people have, have written about. I can't identify either an organ that transduces nor a sensory input that is delivered which is not to deny that we don't have intuition and we don't have these feelings, we don't have a sense of time. No, that we don't have a feeling of time, just I wouldn't want to call them uh, uh, senses in that but way. But are, are receptors, sensory receptors, a requirement in defining and working with senses? Let's say yes. <laughs> okay. It make, makes things uh, uh, easier. I mean, people have looked in the past, I guess, back in the... Decades ago, there's lots of interest in extrasensory reception. And there you would have, you know, the notion that we could communicate with others without there being any obvious sensory channel or sense organ. And, and, and psychologists and other scientists were, you know, spent much time studying these individuals who apparently had or claimed to have these extrasensory powers. So in that sense, it's having a sense organ isn't absolutely necessary. But uh, I guess in the end, they came down to the conclusion that they didn't, they couldn't find evidence for these extrasensory abilities. Um, so maybe the organ is needed after all. <laughs> so going back to these senses that are more basic, why is there so much more research on vision and hearing than on any other sensory modality. And does this imply that vision and hearing are our most important and most complex senses? And is this sensory dominance a law of nature? So it's undoubtedly the case that uh, we are visual creatures, I think, uh, primarily. And that is really captured in all of our brains that more of our neocortex is given over to seeing more than half of the brain is given over to seeing whereas the figures for touch and for hearing the world are only about 10 percent or so for each of those senses and maybe less than one percent it's suggested of the brain the neocortex given over to smell and taste so in that sense it's hardwired in all of us to have more of our brains given over to vision some suggest you know that uh, if you look in sort of the um the genes given over to, to each of our senses, then uh, in the past, we probably had a more dominant sense of smell than we do today. And it suggested maybe, you know, that 
uh, when we moved from four legs and our noses were much closer to the earth and all the smells there. We moved on to two legs, then we could also, on the one hand, see further. And at the same time, our nose has moved away from the smelly earth. And so that shift, change in our posture, may have switched a bit the balance of the senses. So part of the reason is because we think visually, because more of our brain's given over to vision, and that's just the way it is. I think also that there's a sense that vision and hearing are the rational senses, the higher senses, according to the old German philosophers, whereas the other senses are base, lower animal senses of touch and smell and taste, I'm not capable of you know, rational or disinterested thought, uh, it's more primitive. And so that sort of bias against the more emotional senses has also skewed research a bit. That said, I think, you know, in terms of which is the most complex sense, well, that's a hard one to answer. I mean, there probably I mean, could be grounds for saying that, you know, vision, is, the smell is the most complex sense because we still don't understand how it works. Whereas we've got a lot of vision sorted out. Smell might be more complex in that we can discriminate more odours. It's been suggested maybe even a trillion, according to some researchers, different smells. So probably the band, the, the kind of a, the dynamic range of smells maybe is much greater than for other senses. And also a part of the story, it turns out, is uh, if you go back, there's a very nice paper from a three or four years ago, that if you go back to the 1880s, 1890s, then uh, as the frontal cortex was being discovered, this was higher rational thought, that the early, I think, French uh, neuropsychologists, those who studied sort of brain damage and, and such like, wanted to you know, have as big a frontal cortex as possible for all these higher rational logical functions. And so what they had to do to allow that is to actually to shrink down what else was in the front of the brain, which was the smell cortex. So it's kind of an accident of history and the way we'd like to see ourselves that, you know, um, people thought that smell was so unimportant because they wanted the front of the brain to be devoted to other stuff. Whereas, you know, vision is at the back of the head. So that's kind of a, a distant uh, from it. Uh, so for, yeah, for all those various reasons, historical, neurophysiological, um, uh, uh, and uh, historical, I guess, uh, vision does tend to be the, the dominant one and the one that we can most easily really talk about. We have more words for sights and sounds than we do for smells. We probably can't describe smells. And also in terms of you know, sort of presentation of stuff, uh, it's much easier to present, to represent, to describe what one's done in the visual experiment. Whereas if I try and tell you about my last smell experiment, you know, where can I go? What can I do? Or if I tell you about the last smell art exhibit I saw, we're sort of lost for words and have no way of transmitting, communicating about those other senses. And that also, I think, biases people towards the easier to describe and reproduce. So designers and marketing researchers have looked at sense combinations for quite some time now, mixing music with scent in shopping centers, taste with music in restaurants, and so on. And indeed, some of your experiments have focused exactly on these type of combinations as well. Now, currently, how much do we know scientifically about the senses and the way they interact? And I know this is such a broad question, and it seems to me that probably we should start talking a little bit about the terminology because there is a huge confusion out there in the wide literature about senses and sense combinations. So for example, we could see terminology such as the cross-modal binding problem, cross-modal versus synesthetic correspondences or associations, spatiotemporal correspondences and semantic congruencies, sensory harmony, or incongruence and so on. Not to mention cross-modal versus multi-sensory. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that too. Uh, true. So, um, yep, there is something that keeps many of us psychologists awake at night, or maybe it's just me, the distinction between cross-modal and multi-sensory, which are terms that are used a lot in titles and, uh, and papers. And they're both relating to how the senses link one to another. So in that sense, they're sort of synonymous. And yet I think they're quite different in that... Um, at least when I use the term multi-sensory, it's when inputs like sights and sounds come together to give you an object, a multi-sensory object that embodies all those things. So when I'm hearing somebody speak, I might see their lips and hear their voice. And these two senses come together into one thing, which is what that person is communicating. Same in the case of a flavor. I might, uh, I've got my cup of tea here. I can taste, uh, what can I taste? A bit of citrus or my lemon. I, I, I can smell the, the green tea aromas. 
and my brain combines those two senses, multi-sensorily integrates them into the flavor of that tea. By contrast, if I were to change the color of the lighting in here or play a bit of sweet music, that would change the taste of my tea, but I wouldn't be literally tasting the music. It wouldn't be part of my, this object or experience. Then that's when I use the term sort of cross-modal when one sense influences the others without being bound up in the same final experience. And I think, you know, uh, it's certainly true that where, where, wherever one looks, be it in art or design or philosophy, psychology, one sees both the dominance of the visual, most books, most journals, the longest chapters in books are given over to, to vision uh, rather than any other sense. And also uh, that while it's true that designers and others, marketeers have started to engage with more than just the visual sense, they started to ask questions about, you know, what does our brand sound like? What should it sound like? What should it smell like? And in the shopping center, let's not just think about the, uh, the visual layout and, and the design, but also should we have a distinctive sound or a smell? They've been doing it mostly on a kind of a sense by sense approach. So the sensory marketeers, the designers have got the message that engaging more senses creates more potential touch points with the consumer, more engaging potentially experience. But what few of them have realized until very recently is that the senses are not independent. They interact all the time, both in objects and things like in my cup of tea, the color and the, and the smell and the taste, but also how, how the environments in which we're in can affect. So how the lighting, the music, the temperature, the scent in a shopping center or shop can affect our perception of what we're eating, drinking, what we buy, uh, how much we spend. And for me, it's these interactions between the senses that are key. Because if you just take a sense by sense approach, and I see this very often, even fact in some of these shopping center studies, they say, yeah, if we play the, the music, then store sales go up. If we, if we introduce a scent, pleasant scent, maybe store sales go up. So surely if we combine scent and smell, we should get a bigger boost to sales. And very often it doesn't work like that for some reason. In fact, sales go down. So I think there's a real challenge when you think about combining senses. On the one hand, you may have a danger of sensory overload. You just get too much stuff going on. Like in an Abercrombie and Fitch store, there's that loud music, there's the smells and there's the lights. And together it's too sensory overload. So that's to be avoided. Uh, and then on the other hand, the problem of congruency that you mentioned, which is that if I'm in a, going to an environment and there's an upbeat, uh, high tempo music, very arousing, but I smell a calming lavender that I associate with bedtime, then what should I think? I can't combine these senses, they're incongruent. They're telling me different things, pulling me in different directions. And that's very often what happens when, when you think about the senses separately, you don't think about how they link. And in the lab here in Oxford and with uh, collaborators and uh, colleagues around the world, our sort of psychologists and neuroscientists were very interested in these connections between the senses. First studying them in the laboratory, but then hopefully, at least in our case, thinking about how they apply in the real world too. And they're noting that you can't necessarily always predict how the senses will interact because sometimes one sense dominates completely what's going on in the other senses. When we add color to a white wine and make it look rose, pink or red, suddenly, just by changing the color, we can completely change the taste and the flavor of the wine. Vision is dominating taste and smell. Other times the senses combine and, and kind of give you a sort of a super additive boost almost, which is when if you take a very faint smell and a very faint taste, they can combine to a much, much richer flavor percept than you'd expect from the sum of the parts. Um, but if you get it wrong, you get this incongruency, you get suppression. So these various laws or rules of multi-sensory integration. Um, and uh, yeah, we try and Take them from the lab to the real world in order to help uh, those who are now starting to engage with more of their consumers senses think about how to do that more effectively by building on congruency multi-sensory integration and cross-modal interactions but where is science right now so where are we scientifically in terms of which combinations do work in harmony and which don't how well do we understand this cross-modal associations space in the lab as well as in, in the real world? I think if one goes back for a century or so, then you see the artists and the designers that, that there were. I think it'd be like, you know, Kandinsky and the painter and Scriabin, the composer, many others, who were trying to connect the senses, who were trying to paint music, for example, 
or, or in Scriven's case, you know, add a, a visual score, a loose to his music. And they were very often thinking about that in terms of how do we connect the senses? How do we translate music into paint colors? And how can we harmonize the senses? But what always happened is that it, that, that intuition that these senses are connected and there is a certain harmony sometimes when sensory inputs align somehow, maybe mystical in some people's view, it always gets tied up in the world of synesthesia immediately. Because if we're talking about how one sense connects to another, well, that's like synesthesia, isn't it? These people who have colored numbers and days of the week and, and Scriabin was a synesthete and uh, Kandinsky probably was too. But I think that's kind of the, entirely the wrong way to go. And I've sort of tracked back to the 1880s, interest in synesthesia, interest in this kind of cross-modal harmony and alignment. And they kind of go in, in, in lockstep with each other, up and down in popularity as the decades go by. But I think it's fundamentally misleading and wrong because by definition, kind of what the synesthetes experience is idiosyncratic. Each synesthete experience a slightly different connection between their senses. In that sense, knowing how an individual synesthete connects their sight and sound is useless to me if I want to design something that's harmonious for the general population. So I think the first step is then to say, okay, there may be connections between the senses, correspondences that allow for intersensory or multisensory harmony when that light seems to just harmonize with that sound, with that timbre, with that taste, with that smell. But we must not get distracted by synesthesia, but must instead look for these, these correspondences, I call them, these sort of alignments, feelings of matching between abstract attributes like colors and pitch and timbre and shape and texture and lightness and size and pitch and smell and taste. And over the last 10, 20 years now, there's been a huge explosion of research trying to document these correspondences, these surprising connections, so that we find, for example, you know, that, that sweet tastes correspond to or harmonize well with pinkish red colors, with high pitched notes, with a piano rather than a brass instrument, timbre, with round shapes rather than angular shapes, with silky materials rather than rough textures to touch. So we and many others now are just documenting more and more of these consistent mappings and doing so scientifically you know showing that 80 90 percent of people all agree that sweet is round and bitter is angular and then take those insights and think okay how can we use them to create experiences where the senses might come in be harmonious is that even possible i can say things kind of match across the senses but does it give me harmony or not well, that was just the title of a paper that came out last week, I think a big one with a colleague in Italy, uh, Nicolo Di Stefano, a music philosopher, I think he calls himself, um, sort of tracking the history of, uh, of the use of the term harmony from its origins in, in sort of uh, music uh, through to its contemporary usage as people say, yes, this glass of wine harmonizes perfectly with a bit of Mozart or, 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 and so on, or this food and this drink uh, harmonize. The, the terminology is more common these days, harmonizing sensations across the senses as we develop multisensory experiences, sensplorations, sensoriums, experiential events. Um, but is it anything more than metaphor? Can you really have a harmony between the senses? Um, that I'm not quite so sure. I think you can have a feeling that these things go together, but whether you want to call that harmony, mm, I'm not quite so sure we should necessarily take that step yet. But that we can scientifically study these, these links, these correspondences, it's clear that we can check them across the world, across development, uh, and then that we can take those insights and think about the design of plates and dishes and environments. And, um, and in some of our recent work, you know, how we can create music that harmonizes with a fragrance or a flavor is uh, legitimate studies for science at the borders with art and design because all we can do is really document these connections and have an intuition about which ones might exist and why, but we can't turn that into something you might want to enjoy as an experience that requires kind of the, the artistic or the creative genius to take the scientific insights and, and turn them into something desirable, delicious, enjoyable, engaging, memorable. Yes. So now, going back to the hierarchy of the senses, research now shows that this hierarchy is not universally true across cultures. So we know this by now. 
it seems to be shaped by biological predispositions, but most importantly, by cultural influences. This complex phenomenon involves an intricate interplay of intention, perception, context, behavior, interplay, which is often culturally influenced, as I said. If this is the case, how much can neuroscience tell us about the senses and the way they combine and interact? And thus, how much is left to social, cultural, and environmental factors? I might disagree with the premise there. I accept that cultural factors influence sensory and multi-sensory perception. And I certainly accept that recent research shows that there are some cultures who are much better able to say, name smells, have a much more you know, richer smell world than, than you or I might in a developed environment. But I wouldn't think that leads necessarily to saying they have a different sensory hierarchy. Because I bet if we stuck even one of these groups who, you know, who, who maybe navigates by smell, who has a very rich vocabulary and describe every smell, if we put them in a brain scanner, I doubt, I would bet money that they don't show more of their brain given over to smell than to vision. They will still show the same kind of imbalance in cortical real estate. Yeah, there are differences in importance, but I don't think that sort of flips the hierarchy. And I think, you know, the neuroscience you know, would support that by saying, no, if we, the amount of brain given over to these senses hasn't changed in these groups. Maybe these groups who have a very rich smell vocabulary have a slightly larger olfactory cortex, or maybe they use it more efficiently, or maybe it's better connected to language and other parts of the brain, but I don't think that's sufficient for a change in dominance. And to some extent, this is actually related to the difference between the universals and the particulars. As scientists, and of course, I am talking mostly about computer science, artificial intelligence in general, because this is my area of research, we tend to focus on shared human traits, events, object properties, and so on. Identifying common features to produce data, we can trust and generalize. However, examining these personal individual differences, either social, cultural, and so on, is also crucial in delivering these personalized experiences. So instead of looking at these individual differences as noise, we should take them as valuable data. This is crucially relevant, not only to fields such as sales, marketing, but also education and healthcare. People do seem to be stimulated by different stimuli in uh, the same way or not so much, right? So receptors are activated rather differently in humans, it seems. So when it comes to this difference between the universals and the particulars, how much do we know about the individual differences in somatosensory stimulation and perception? Well, I should just show you here the title of the paper I'm just working on at the moment. If you can just about see that, probably not quite. Individual differences in the cross-modal correspondences. So it's coming up. Coming up. Okay. So uh, I think in a way, I mean, often as a psychologist, one... If you speak to the man or woman in the street, they will say, you know, but, but how can you get any generalizations? Because we're all different, aren't we? Uh, so it's almost you know, uh, precluding the possibility of doing science around perception or cognition or psychology because of these individual differences, so it seems. And yet our starting point has to be, I think, that assume we're all the same and try and establish some rules and generalizations. I mean, it's only ever, I mean, for all our results, then ever 100% of people do this. It's always 80, 90, 70, 60%. Significant number do this more than that. But from that, we say everyone does it. And so I think, you know, in the world of multisensory, I think the first challenge is to say, I mean, go back 20 years and people who were vision scientists, they were hearing scientists, they were touch scientists, and they didn't talk to each other at all. They didn't think multisensory interactions existed or were important or relevant. So the first job is to say, no, these interactions between the senses are crucial fundamental and you start out by assuming everyone's the same and saying yes in 90 percent of the people we tested when we played this sound it changed the way this thing looked when we added the color to the wine it made it taste different for and then once you've established some of those generalizations that work at the group level then i think it's the point to start saying ah but are we all the same how do these things develop 
are they affected by culture? And that's what we sort of found ourselves doing more and more over the last few years. In part spurred on by is a research saying, you know, complaining about weird students of psychology research they, for the acronym from a paper, the Western educated, industrialized, rich and democratic boys and girls studying psychology around the world, who mostly in North America, who constitute 90 some percent of all data in, in psychology experiments. That's got to change unless we think we are all identical. So partly spurred on by that and partly spurred on by the fact that, you know, in the past we'd always do experiments in the lab in Oxford. So it would require or re rely on whoever we could find to take part in our experiments, tends to the local populace, well-educated. Nowadays, I think, you know, most of our research online, uh, even before COVID, and that's allowing us the opportunity to do multi-country studies simultaneously, seven countries around the world, to see, do we all think that, you know, pinkish red is sweet? Or is that just something that Western minds think? Turns out we all do think that pinkish red is the sweetest colour, and we've tested that on over 5,000 people from every continent at the Science Museum in London. So there are some degree of generalizations, but I think you know, these, these individual differences do then become more interesting once we've established the basics, the generalizations, and hence why I'm writing this paper now, um, and looking at it both from that sort of cultural differences, but then also developmental differences, and possibly also personality-based differences as well, maybe genetic differences in, in the way we perceive the world. And so I've got a kind of a folder of stuff, which I, as you mentioned, I can see when you come across these individual differences before, when not everyone does the same thing, that is noise, that's an irritation, that initial stage of research. But I've been collecting papers where they have reported anecdotally at the end, you know, there were some group of people who just didn't do it, who didn't get the thing, who didn't experience the illusion, the cross-modal thing, and think, you know, what, what's, what's common or different about them? Are there, in this current paper, I'm sort of thinking, are there, um, I mean, on the one hand, I think there are, there are sort of differences in, the specific combinations people make. So I think everyone will associate tastes like sweet and sour with colors, with musical instruments, with timbres, with shapes. And I think some of those correspondences will be universal and others may show some cultural variation. But of course, it's going to be a, a huge job to go around the world and test all sorts of people to see which of these things are universal. Well, how many cultures have you tested? And, you know, and the biggest cultural differences we found were when we went to the Himba tribe of um, in rural cocoa land in Namibia, hunter gatherer community with no schools, no written language, no supermarkets. And they, bizarrely, to, to my previous study, they don't think that milk sweet tastes are round and bitter tastes are angular. They don't think that still water is round and sparkling water is angular, like everyone else we've ever tested around the world does. I still have no explanation for that difference, but that everyone everywhere in the world do show connections, I think is true. It's just which particular connections are lined up might be where the, a lot of the variation lies. And then separately in a sort of a, just within a more local context, I'm really interested in the way that designers of the past, personal hero, if that's the right word, people like Louis Cheskin uh, of the 1950s Madison Avenue's marketing magician, Former psychologist, I think he's sort of exiled after the Second World War or during. He's, he writes about, a lot about helping companies to design packaging and logos. He is big on the, the golden breasts of the McDonald's two arches. He put the round circle in the middle of the seven up. And reading his things five decades on, many of the correspondences he was picking up and using in design to help companies sell more were kind of rediscovering today. And that left me, leads me to wonder, are, are there, is there kind of, do we all lie on a spectrum? Some of us are more multi-sensory than others. Or do some of us have a, a better intuition of these surprising connections, these correspondences than others? And are those individuals who have stronger or more introspection about these things, are they the ones who then become designers and artists, perhaps or not? So do you think that this, or some actually individual differences and different kinds of individual differences can be explained fully by activated areas in the brain? I'm not sure I care. <laughs> in as much as I'm, yeah, I don't really have any time for brain science as such. I guess the ultimate answer would, ha would have to be, 
Yes, if your brain measuring technology was sufficiently high resolution, discriminating in space and in time or in neural sort of structures, that any difference that you saw in behavior between two individuals would have to have some correlate up here. Otherwise, where else does it come from? But I'm not convinced that you know, as you drill down into subtler and subtler differences between individuals, whether the brain imaging technology has sufficiently high resolution. So many questions it can tell black from white, but this shade of gray from that shade of gray can be much harder to show. And I guess for me, I, I'd be more interested to, to think, are these individual differences are they just sort of noise that we know we change over time or are they consistent in an individual over time? Can we train them or not? And would we want to even train a greater connection? And, uh, and as you mentioned, sort of how can we then use this knowledge to sort of personalize experiences for the individual's unique sensory world? Uh, for example, we have done some work um, a few years ago looking at, um, I think it was beer we tested, and looking at which sort of musical note and which instrument match different tastes of beer. And we found that a group response, the average across 20 or 30 or 500 people was that this pitch of sound was the perfect pitch, pitch of harmony, in fact, it's called, for the beer. But of course, some people picked a slightly higher tone, some people picked a slightly lower tone as matching the taste of the beer. So then we said, okay, if we play back the group average response versus your preferred the frequency you picked, do you get any benefit from personalizing it in that way? And in that case, at least didn't find any improvement in the match, that the group average was, was as good as personalizing, which is not to say in other situations, I'm not so optimistic that one could personalize experience. And even, even just, if, you, if people believe that the experience is being personalized for them, that's enough in many cases, whether or not it delivers a, measurable benefit. Right, very important point. So although many people can live well and safe with some sensory impairment, any disturbances or loss of our senses can have a profound impact on us. For instance, researchers have looked at how other senses compensate for the lack of visual sense in visually impaired people. Sensory compensation refers to the lack of or alteration of one sensory modality that could change the distribution of input from other sensory modalities. How can we best capture this cooperation of human sensory modalities to inform, for example, interface design or product design? How much time and effort is required for the human nervous system to accommodate these new inputs from various individual sensory receptors? You are right, there's a lot of interest around cross-modal brain plasticity in recent years. And you know, that we used to sort of believe that the visual bit of the brain at the back was only for seeing and the touch bit of the brain over the years, somatosensory cortex was only for feeling and the smell brain was only for smelling. And each part of the brain kind of separate just as our sensory receptors are separate on the outside. But with the emerging neuroscience and psychological science, we become increasingly aware that the senses are always talking to each other, whether we realize it or not, constant state of communication. And that when things go wrong, when a sense is lost or was never developed in the first place, if you're born congenitally blind, say, then what happens to that bit of brain that is not being stimulated by its normal sensory input? And it seems like the other senses come in to take over the space. And so that you find in, say, congenitally blind individuals as a reading braille, say, with their fingertips, they're actually using not just their touch brain to do that, but they're also using their visual brain it's got nothing else to do. So that would be described as a, a sort of cross-modal plasticity. One might imagine that that leads to improved performance, that the blind braille reader, if they've got both the touch bit of the brain and the visual bit of the brain to help, they should do better. And often they do, but not always. Yes, there is a lot of interest in cross-modal plasticity and, and it's amazing how much plasticity we can see. It is constrained. I think it's, it's easier to or maybe for hearing and vision and touch to show plasticity because they're sort of more closely located. But when you try and think about, well, the smell bit of the brain, can we see plasticity with vision at the back, two areas that are further apart? Far less evidence of that. 
So there may be constraints on how plastic the brain can be and in whether or not it actually gives you benefits is, is up for debate. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. And when it does, it's never really quite as much benefit as you'd imagine. By having a whole extra bit of brain to do something, you should be much, much better. That's not quite the case. Now we know about the crossmodal plasticity that has kind of gone hand in hand with a growth of interfaces, sensory substitution devices designed in the early days in the 60s, for example, for those who are blind to use their skin, a sense that's not really being used much normally in everyday life. And yet our biggest sense, 16 to 80% of body mass is our skin surface. Why not use that sense, the stomach or the back contiguous region of, of skin to present images taken by a, a camera on your, on your glasses, convert a visual image into a tactile image and uh, given that the, the blind have all this extra brain to process touch, maybe that would work. Perhaps allowing the blind to see is sort of the claim contested by the philosophers. And in fact, in practice, never, this has never come to pass as something not quite working in all of this. In that if you go back to the 1960s and 70s, the US military were very interested in tactile displays to communicate. When hearing and vision were overloaded, we have the, um, People talking about tactile television, 1970. People will be one day watching TV through their skin. That hasn't come to pass. Others saying, you know, the, the stock brokers will have the stock figures vibrating on a vibrating belt. So you'll always know what your stocks are doing by touch. That's never happened. And there aren't, you don't see many of those 40 million people worldwide who are blind wearing a sensory substitution device. Why not? Is that a technological limitation? Is it a cognitive limitation, a limitation of plasticity? It's probably a bit of all of those things. In the past, I think it was sort of technology, that the technology wasn't up to the job, that it was too expensive, bulky, didn't look great, wasn't aesthetically appealing. Nowadays, it's the technology being shrunk, it's getting better, it looks more beautiful. Some of these sensory substitution devices that can now be run off your, your, your um, mobile device. So they look cool they're portable they're cheap and yet still they haven't caught on and i think the reason is it's partly because they maybe they, they don't convey what's important they might you might have a sensory substitution device like a sound or a touch to make up for a loss of vision and you might be able to use that to tell you what an object is and where things are but it doesn't convey any of the hedonics any of the emotional quality of stimuli whether you like it or not and for that reason, people perhaps are, are disinclined to engage with these devices, this technology to help make up for what can be a devastating loss of the sense. And so I think, you know, there's a real challenge there to say, is there something we can do to tweak the technology in order to allow these people to use such devices to make up for a lost sense? Or is it a lost cause that no matter what the technology comes out, it will never be sufficient for people to merit the effort required to learn how to use it. Mm. So talking about technology, let's now move to technology of the future. How do you see its role, and in particular here, artificial intelligence, augmented reality, virtual reality, in shaping our awareness and use of the senses? In particular, how do you see the role of technology, such as immersive technologies, in the next five to 10, 20 years in reviving our sensorium and the felt experience of others to access the past and also the, the present. I guess I think about the AI and big data sort of se somewhat separately from the augmented reality and virtual reality. I'm interested in both areas. I do wonder whether in the future, the next few years, I may be able to dispense with participants in, in experiments altogether and just treat the internet as my subject and look for I mean, a lot of the work we do is trawling looking for new correspondences new connections that we can use and build on and ex try and explain and I do that by bringing people into the lab or getting them online and saying what sound or shape matches this taste but it's been suggested that maybe I could get the same answers that I currently get from asking people in person just by doing sort of big data analysis of online corpora of text and of images and such like. Unfortunately, I don't have the skills to do that, but uh, that's sort of an area of interest. So I could see that, you know, AI and big data may help to 
discover new connections, bypassing the individual in the first place. In terms of um, augmented reality, virtual reality, I think that uh, in one sense, I'm, I'm sort of confused or curious that when I always talk of augmented and virtual reality, it's all about visual. It's visual dominance all over again. In fact, when you think about it, music, pre-recorded music is, is augmented virtual reality, isn't it? I listen to a pop group playing in my living room. They're not really there. It is virtual. So we've had virtual reality for a long time. All people are getting excited about is a visual version of it. Uh, and there, um, we are doing some research on, on VR and augmented reality foods, trying to give you food experiences you've never had before. But I think the challenge is, even in the best case, the augmented reality, virtual reality is just for your hearing and vision. What about the other emotional senses, the ones that are neglected? Touch. Well, I can wear a haptic glove, kind of, or my mobile device can vibrate. But that's a pretty thin, tactile experience. And when it comes to smell and taste, so many people would love to be able to digitally, virtually stimulate smell and taste. It's never happened, and I can't foresee it happening. So I'm imagining the future, uh, five to ten years, the best case scenario will be mixed reality. I mean, we're particularly interested in sort of food experiences and technology in VR and AR. And there, if you want to stimulate smell and taste, that's got to be a physically thing in your hand that you're eating, that you're smelling. And how can that be combined with digital, auditory, and visual technologies? At the same time, I'm also I'm just going to a conference next week in Dusseldorf in Germany on what is proprioceptive art. Um, and there I'm sort of th got me thinking about that, that in a way some of the most immersive experiences and of course the question in sort of VR and AR is how can you increase the immersion of the wearer of the user in the experience and more immersion is better you really feel like you're in the forest or the jungle or the dungeon and so it has more impact on you and there if I think about preperception and what is most immersive of experiences then it's things like theme park rides roller coasters fairground rides will it and these you cannot be but immersed in the experience you're totally there you can't and yet this is something again that vr ar cannot capture at all i think it's distraction away to you know the technology only gives us control over hearing and vision digitally augmented virtually really and as such as the technology develops and it's great technology in some cases it's still furthering this visual dominance that we're trying to get away from. And it's not really addressing the problems of, of how to stimulate the emotional senses. And it is, I think, those emotional senses that do pack very often the emotional punch and do, in the case of proprioception, sort of bodily movement, deliver the, the, the ultimate immersive experience. Yes, so it always, with AI, AR and VR, it's always this question of how close can we get to understanding how people really feel and experience reality, whatever we call reality. But how about the ethical implications of such technologies? We have to talk about this because this is such an important aspect of it. What do you think? Ethical implications don't keep me awake at night. <laughs> so I probably uh, don't how come? too much about it. I don't know, what's the problem? <laughs> Well, every technology has two sides, right? For us researchers, this is something that is important, but something that we cannot really fully control. We don't know who's going to use our technology, especially that in our field, we actually have to publish our research experiments and results. Well, I guess, I sort of think, you know, very often um, when I give talks around the senses and sensory design, sensory marketing, then the first question will crop up at the end is, you know, is that ethical? That's scary. Big companies are using this against us to make us buy more, shop more, spend more, all without us realizing. And yet I think the really the, the science is just the science, the insight is just the insight, and any scientific insight can be used for good or evil, less good purposes. It's just the science, innately valenced, good or bad. And that through, I can see lots of positive potential benefits to the technology, so that keeps me uh, content. 
I'm aware that uh, I guess many of the experiences, the events, the sensorium, sensorations that we're engaged in are around you know, trying to open up people to, to new kinds of experiences, see how the connect, senses are connected rather than a direct marketing push. But clearly the things could be used in that way too eventually. And I think, you know, as I'm really interested, I suppose, in, in um, from, from the last book on sense hacking came out last year and paperback this year, all around using the harnessing the power of the senses to improve well-being, social, emotional, cognitive. And therein, of course, technology plays a role and immersive experiences. And there I've been thinking a lot about you know, the nature effect. On one hand, the power of nature to make us feel better. Seeing the blues and greens of nature, that's of course a visually dominant way of thinking about it. But also the sounds of nature, the birds and the smells of nature, all great. And kind of surprisingly, it turns out that digital nature is as good as the real thing. So in that sense, as our skies are, um, you know, sort of filled with less birds than they used to be, there's less noise of nature. And yeah, I know from the research that the more bird varieties you can hear, the happier, the healthier you'll be. Then it sort of offers the opportunity, I think, of using augmented virtual reality to provide a kind of digital nature boost and that's you know thinking about then and i've seen it when i was at the welcome collection in london in december there's some artist who had like a audio visual smell installation real physical smell and then with the digital images of a japanese forest and with the sounds of the birds and stuff and the, and the, and the weather and that's being used in hospitals to try and improve well-being was it immersive well the smell wasn't very good i don't think didn't really a bit clumsy and artificial but you know things in that space are being used immersive experiences to help promote well-being there in a hospital in a, in a sort of organizational setting but i'm a bit equally interested about how that might be used in in airports to avoid the stress or in, in a home environment how we could use these technologies these these insights about the way the senses affect us to harness potentially the digital nature effect and maybe you know that the best way forward may be through some combination of the real nature. I can hear some birds some of the time outside my window here, combined with some digital birdies on my computer. And this sort of mixed reality with lots of bird variety will deliver the benefits. Um, and the more that this knowledge gets pr promoted and put out there, the more we at home can, can, can use it to our own advantage because it is just science and just insights and knowledge. Yeah, there is there is a lot of opportunity to really contribute to social good in any area of research, and in particular this one, especially when we are actually trying to some extent to inform the public as well as to bring awareness and revive the sensorium to some extent. We are at the end of our show here, unfortunately. But how can our audience learn more about you, your books and your research and where they can find you? Well, they'll find me here in Oxford most of the time, <laughs> but uh, to find out more, yeah, I'm, I don't really have a web presence as such. Probably just type, type my name and that should bring up lots of the papers, uh, some of which are open access for people just to download, but I'm happy to send them to anybody who drops me an email. And then uh, summarized both the uh, Sense Hacking book which is the one that came out last year and it's now anything about five languages is all around using the power of the senses both the real sensory inputs but also the digital the techno the futuristic ones to improve social cognitive emotional well-being and so that's a good place to start thank you for your time charles this was great thank you